behalf of Hawaii Seed, GMO Free Oahu, and Seeds of Truth, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to join us this evening. Before I introduce Dr. Latham, I'd like to remind you to please silence your phones and to let you know, if you don't, that the restrooms are right behind us. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Dr. Latham, who is gifting our clean food movement with a generous amount of his time, as he has graciously agreed to also share his mana'o on Kauai and Maui. So these talks um, on the neighbor islands will also be recorded and posted on Hawaii Seed Facebook page and website, and also on Dr. Latham's Independent Science News website. We would like to thank the University of Hawaii for providing us this beautiful space this evening. And um, we'd also like to thank Oren and Olelo for recording the talk. Also a big mahalo to our volunteers and to our funders, the CS Fund. Um, they've been very helpful in supporting these ongoing community conversations. Um, so it's an honor to be introducing Dr. Latham. He holds a master's degree in crop genetics and a PhD in virology. He is a co-founder and executive director of the Bioscience Research Resources Project, and he's the ed editor of the Independent Science News. Can we all give Dr. Latham a warm round of applause? So, aloha, everybody. And uh, thanks so much for inviting me here. Uh, thanks, I want to give a special big thanks to Hector and Mary for looking after me these last three days. It's been a great experience and a steep learning curve here in Hawaii. And, uh, but I've really also had a fun time and a very relaxing time. So uh, what I'm doing here is um, what I'm going to give you a talk. And I'm going to give separate talks on Kauai, Kauai and, excuse me, and, uh, and also on Maui. And what the talks will be, they have quite similar titles, but they will actually be quite different talks. So I'll be tackling the same issues, but kind of from a different direction uh, on each place. So, so um, I'm hoping that all of these talks will be recorded, and they'll kind of form a unit, if you like, because you know there's a lot to talk about in these issues. And, uh, and it is a little bit complicated. Uh, it's also quite subtle, some of it. And so it's really helpful. It's unfamiliar to most people, too. And so it's helpful to, to understand it from different directions. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll be inspired to watch some of these videos online. So uh, most of you uh, are likely, excuse me, I haven't got the pointer. Ah, Hector, slide, please. So most of you are likely to know our work probably from this website, which is called Independent Science News. So it's a publication of our nonprofit, and um, our nonprofit is focused on food and agriculture. We have the next slide. So the reason for food and agriculture is because we see it as the nexus of our environmental and social crisis. So whether you have a concern that is about biodiversity, or about uh, rainforests, or about coral reefs, or about climate change, or even about immigration, or the quality of water, you are likely, if you follow the logical trail, physical logical trail back, you are likely to end up with the, the main, possibly sometimes the only cause, being uh, in, found in agriculture. So if you think about uh, climate change, for example, the, Agricultural system is a huge source of those carbon dioxide molecules, also methane. It's also, uh, for example, it contributes to the health crisis. And the health crisis is a huge part of our economy, which also contributes to the carbon dioxide uh, pollution in the atmosphere, and many other forms of pollution, too. So, so uh, that is the reason for our focus on food and agriculture. What I tell people is that if we're going to solve these crises, we have to tackle the contribution of agriculture to each of them. And if we don't tackle the contribution of agriculture to each of them, then we will never solve these crises. 
especially I'm thinking about the climate crisis, but it applies to them all. So, uh, can I have the next slide? Um, so, our, the second focus of our work is to try to get to the nature of the ideas that are behind our ecological and social crises. So many people uh, have a tendency to focus on this, what we would see as kind of superficial aspects of these crises. So for example, food waste. Lots of people are concerned about food waste, but the question to ask about food waste is why do we generate so much food, right? We overproduce, right? That is the linear cause of that food crisis. So focusing exclusively on the food crisis, is, of the food waste rather, is not necessarily going to solve the root cause of the problem. And uh, so for example, uh, another example would be that many people believe, because they've been told uh, thousands and thousands of times, that we have uh, a food crisis of the kind that we basically will not be able to feed the future population uh, when that population grows, when it eats more meat, when it uh, changes in demographics, and so on and so forth. So, uh, but actually, it turns out that that food crisis is a myth created by agribusiness. And, but many people who are environmentalists think, for example, that we, need, we should not, it's immoral, essentially, to buy organic food or be invested in agroecology and different farming systems because only agribusiness, this is the logic of the myth, right? Only agribusiness with its supposed high productivity can actually save us from this problem. And so, so essentially unraveling and understanding the, the propaganda of this food crisis is a fundamental, should be a fundamental objective of the, the food movement and of uh, environmentalists in general for the reasons uh, that I put forward just now. That food is the, food is the basis for, for, for restoring many, uh, many systems that are broken, but we can't do that if we, if we, if we don't understand that, that we have alternatives to agribusiness. So what I want to talk about is one aspect of this, which is uh, to do with chemical testing. And what I'm gonna be doing is talking about a project that we have uh, played a big part in called the Poison Papers. So this picture is of uh, Oregon, the north coast, the quite close to the coast of Oregon, of quite big mountains, where there's forest spraying uh, for, for basically weed control. Can I have the next slide? So this person here is Carol Van Strum. Her family, was sprayed, they have a homestead in these mountains, and her family was sprayed by helicopters uh, spraying what turned out to be Agent Orange in the mid-1970s. Uh, the fish died in the river, the pets died, some of them, the animals died, the, her children became sick. She didn't think about it too much until it happened, the exact same thing happened again. And then she realized this is not a coincidence these sprayings are causing massive harms in our uh, environment and in our, uh, their locality, for example. So there were stories, uh, local stories of huge numbers of miscarriages, for example, and also birth defects that were basically uh, located in, in, in regions where uh, there was spraying. So, and she wrote a book uh, called A Bit of Fog, which is about her experiences and the campaign that she started uh, together with her husband to basically try to get to the bottom of what, what did the EPA, what did other agencies, what did the companies know about the toxicity of the chemicals being used in those forests. But essentially what it turned out was that basically after the Vietnam War, the companies still were making Agent Orange, they were all set up to make Agent Orange, so basically it started being sprayed in US forests. So, so she did this campaign and uh, she uncovered a huge amount of information which uh, she, was, she was writing for our website. And, uh, and I talked to her and she would make these powerful claims about what EPA knew, what EPA was doing, what companies knew, what they were doing. And I would say to Carol, you can't 
put these claims on our website without having some support. You know, I want to see the PDF files of the minutes where they said this, so on and so forth. And so, so eventually she got tired of me and she wouldn't publish, but I knew that she had this information. So I made some phone calls and learned a little bit more about her and the fact that she played a crucial role in the banning of 245T, which is one of the uh, two parts of, uh, of Agent Orange. So the reason Agent Orange is, is no longer sprayed in the US is in large part down to her. And she was working with lawyers. She, she got kind of enrolled in all these projects with lawyers, with Greenpeace, with nonprofits in the Northwest, basically to fight all this forest spraying. Can I have the next slide? So, so these are the kind of basic details of the project. Is it possible to bring the edges in a little bit? Hector, do you know? Because uh, we're probably going to miss some information. No, OK, it's probably not. So I don't know if you can think about that a little bit. But I'll, I'll just keep going, because I have quite a bit to say. And we, <clears throat> we can, hopefully, it won't be too much of a problem. So ourselves and the Center for Media and Democracy, which is based in Madison, Wisconsin, and Carol, and uh, someone called Peter von Stackelberg, who was a reporter who uh, covered some of the stories that Carol was uncovering at the time. Uh, between us, we digitized 250,000 pages, which is nearly three tons of paper, to a website called Document Cloud. And Document Cloud allows you basically to store large amounts of data online. And we called the project the Poison Papers. And you can visit this website, and it will guide you to those papers and provide you with information about media who have covered the papers and what those stories are, for example. Can I have an slide? So, so these are the main features of the papers. The, it covers pesticides. They cover pesticides, toxins, uh, PCBs, and many other chemicals get folded into them. They were from Freedom of Information Act requests, discovery documents, also some whistleblowers contacted Carol and gave her information. Uh, and they cover these uh, government agencies, uh, these companies, and, and actually many others. And they contain uh, secret minutes, corporate correspondence, internal reports, depositions, and testimonies. So some of these depositions and testimonies, uh, in principle, those things are public record. But in cases where the, where the case never went to court, then they're not basically public records. So they'll be unique to this database. So, and they cover from the 1920s onwards, but mostly from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, chemical testing. Right? The crux of our regulatory system is chemical testing. The integrity of that chemical testing system uh, needs to be pretty watertight in order for you to be protected against chemicals that you're exposed to. The way that it works is the chemical industry generates a product. They send it to a chemical testing laboratory. And here's the name of uh, some of them, industrial biotests, which we'll talk about tonight, no longer exist. But these ones uh, do. And, but they've all, uh, in the, this case, these all have been convicted of chemical testing fraud. So, uh, and then these companies send their uh, products, their information back to the chemical industry, and then uh, it, the essentially summaries of that is passed to the EPA or the FDA. And the EPA can ask, for example, for more information about those tests. But essentially, they're done by these companies. In the early days, the chemical, the, the, what I'm going to talk about tonight, some of the, the industry itself was testing its own chemicals, but it was also using independent labs separately. But, but the ultimate results don't make too much difference. So, so the story begins that I want to tell you about um, tonight is uh, a chemical company, a testing company called Industrial Biotest. They had, this is from uh, a legal record which describes the, uh, some of the situation inside this chemical testing company. Basically, they were uh, doing these tests under, um, you know, to put it simply, under conditions uh, which were not part of the protocol. Right? When you do a chemical test, you submit a protocol to, the, to your customer or the, to the, F, or the FDA or the EPA, and you basically say, we'll do it this way. 
because you need to be doing it that way in order for that customer to know that you haven't you know, avoided the, doing these tasks or avoid, avoided collecting this information in, uh, in order to conceal something that, uh, that those, those people need to know. Next slide. So the company, uh, they were doing it under these conditions. And this is I, this, the, the only missing letter here is I. So it's IBT conducted, uh, they were the largest chemical testing company at the time in the 1960s and 1970s. They forged signatures on studies. They falsified data. They uh, shredded, when this was discovered, they shredded their records, right? And, and uh, the, it's claimed uh, this is entirely inadvertent, right? So this is, this is a situation when your boss, you show up to work one day, and your boss has bought six shredders and asked you to take the contents of the office, your office, and put it into that shredder, right? This is, that's the level of inadvertency we're talking about here. And uh, eventually, three IBT staff uh, were jailed, and IBT, interestingly, turns out not to have been as independent as all that. It was owned by Nalco, which is a chemical company. So an IBT, interestingly, had hired a Monsanto employee to test Monsanto's own products. Right? So this is the, you know, hopefully you're getting an idea of the situation here. And they tested some chemicals that would probably be known to you. So Roundup, every, every uh, uh, Roundup basically, uh, everything, everything that was known about Roundup, for example, at the time had been generated by IBT that was public, uh, publicly available at least. They also tested atrazine, xanthophen, chloropicrin, excuse me, that's 2,4-D herbicide, dicamba, famous herbicide, uh, and uh, resmethrin is a pesticide, and 132 other common household chemicals. So EPA prosecuted IBT. They also looked into the, promised to look into the status of other testing companies at the same time and they organized replacement studies. That was the official story. So the, so the, you know, the trial uh, closed, I think, in 1986. And uh, so essentially that, that story is considered to be, to be history. But what the papers show is something different. So what the papers show is that uh, in 1978, the EPA organized a secret meeting with the chemical industry. So this is about a year and a half after the, the first evidence of fraud by IBT had come to light. Next slide. And what those minutes reveal, so there's, uh, basically it's a single day meeting that takes place at a motel outside of uh, Washington. And the EPA basically is presenting to the industry what they've found from IBT testing. Because the industry, you know, in principle at least, doesn't know what IBT has been, uh, has been doing. All they know is the reports that they get back. I, I'm sure the industry knew a lot more than that, but, but that is the sort of premise of this meeting. So I, EPA reports back to the industry, and they say, we haven't found a single study today where the microfeed, so this is a way of storing the data, is consistent with the validation report. Right? So basically, the company is not truthfully reporting the results of these experiments in, in, in any of the cases that EPA had looked at in the preceding year and a half. So next slide. Uh, the EPA also notes several other things. They claim that we've had very good cooperation, I think, to date with IBT. And I think we recognize the problems they went into trying to pull together some sense out of 20 years' worth of record keeping, and I keep my fingers crossed. Right? So this is the company that's shredding its own data. Right? This is the equivalent of basically EPA not going to IBT and just taking over the office and subpoenaing the company and all the rest of it. Right? They're keeping their fingers crossed. Right? This is the equivalent of asking a murderer to, to collect the evidence against themselves, right? Because IBT people went to prison over this. So, uh, and then this is the relationship. This, this, this sentence here, a couple of sentences here, highlights the relationship between EPA and the companies. So EPA 
is basically asking the companies, the context of this sentence, is the EPA basically says, we, we don't have enough staff to look at all these thousands of experiments. So we're basically going to give you the information that IBT has sent and what the remains of whatever it is we have from information we have from IBT, and then we're going to ask you to evaluate this information. And what this company has done is send back a report to, uh, to EPA and say, oh, it looks fine to us, right? And it turns out that what, what the, the information they're using to support that it's fine to us is actually gibberish, right? They're not actually expecting EPA to, to question their judgment in any way, right? So all these things, they speak to the relationship between EPA and these industries, right? Both the regulator, both the, both the independent labs and the chemical industry itself. Right? So they basically are trusting everything that they're given. And so, uh, you know, I described it slightly wrongly, but, but that, that's actually for the next slide. But here, I don't know if you can read this part. Basically, I'd be sorry, I haven't given this talk before, but IBT reports, here we, here we have a little bit. IBT reports are still reaching scientific conclusions. They're just not attested to by signature, right? So these are people who are crooked, right? And they won't even sign their own reports. But EPA is accepting those reports as, uh, basically, as basically valid, right? It's going to say that we don't need to know anything more about this chemical. Uh, we're just going to take your word for it, even though you yourself will not sign it. Go to the next slide. Later. So this is another interesting thing. There were 4,500 uh, IBT studies, and EPA only looked into uh, a small proportion of those. Right? They basically decided that some studies on certain chemicals, uh, for reasons of their own, uh, were not important enough for them to actually be validated. That means there's a good chance that, that the regulatory system is still relying on those studies. And what, what the prioritization system that the EPA actually used is that they, they, the studies they looked at most carefully were the longer term studies, the chronic toxicity studies that were designed to look for either chronic effects or carcinogenicity. So the studies they mostly didn't look at with things like skin tests and, and, uh, and short-term exposure tests and so forth. Because for whatever reasons, they thought those were less important. But you know, spray operators might disagree about what is a more important uh, chemical test, for example. So here we have, this is another, you know, basically, we're talking about 120 pages of basically EPA people talking at the industry, right? Basically explaining. Uh, what they're finding and what they're going to do about it. And they say, uh, I can't say I'm very happy about this on scientific grounds, but we're trying to run this as a salvage operation. If we can come up with something which gives us a reasonable basis, baseline for controls, which may be applicable to a number of studies, then when controls are not available, we'll compare them against those controls. Right? So those of you who are scientists will know that a an experiment is only as good as its controls. Right? If, you, if you try to cobble together information from a different time and a different place and use that as the baseline for your, for your uh, treatment group, it's not likely to give you very good results. And uh, here is the bit that, sorry, I meant to, to explain earlier. So this is where the company sends, uh, sends back inf supporting information that cannot even be read. And, uh, and EPA questions this. And the company says, well, we never expected you to actually look at the raw data. So next slide. So uh, what these papers show, so this is one document, right? We have 250,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 documents, rather. And this is just, this is, all this information is just from one of them. And uh, what the papers show, and there's attested to in many different parts, is that EPA colluded extensively with the industry, who, the manufacturers, but also IBT itself. That this collusion, right, the purpose, the fundamental purpose of this meeting was basically, because EPA could basically, if, if it wanted to play with a straight bat, as we say in England, right, with the public, 
they would have basically announced the list of all the chemicals that have been tested by IBT and say, you know, we've discovered that these have been uh, fraudulently tested and, and uh, they don't, didn't follow the protocol. There are, you know, ample reasons to doubt that these experiments in many cases were ever even done. And basically, you can use these chemicals at your own risk and or we will remove them from the market. Right? That would have been a precautionary thing to do. But it's obvious that the chemical industry would not like that result. Right? Because you know, the chemicals are thrown into doubt, the integrity of the EPA is thrown into doubt, who's been overseeing all this. Multiple bad things happen to the chemical industry under that scenario. So what the EPA is basically doing here is they're stringing along these investigations in order for, for, to give the chemical companies time to do new experiments so that when they finally reveal the scale of the disaster, and it came out in court at the end of the day, that the companies could basically say, uh, well, we've already done replacement tests, right? So you don't need to worry about this, right? So, but it means that for uh, eight years, the, the public was basically using uh, chemicals that essentially were untested. And, uh, so, and so the, the conclusion here, okay, is that this is basically, uh, this is the, the nature of, the specific nature of that conclusion, uh, the, excuse me, collusion. It's kind of multifarious, but there are many ways in which EPA, even today, makes testing uh, fraud, make, makes testing fraud easy. Right? There are many ways you could, do, you could do more stricter auditing. There's a whole bunch of measures that EPA could take to make testing fraud difficult. Right? For example, it could accept, it could, it could demand to see the original data from testing, right? which it basically is, in, in normal cases, it doesn't ever see that in original information. So there's a, there's a whole ton of things. And, um, and I just wanted to point out, I uh, pointed this out already a little bit, but the chemical testing industry has an obvious business model, right? To please its customers, and the customers are the chemical industry, right? So there's, there's basically, uh, there's a whole set of chemical testing laboratories, and they essentially are competing for business. And whoever gives the chemical companies the best results will get the best business, presumably. So, and I also want to just go a little bit into the question of animal testing. So in the papers, for example, there are uh, statements by some of the chemical companies basically finding evidence of chemical harm and basically telling people who inquire that, well, obviously chemical testing isn't that reliable, right? <laughs> but the problem with that argument is that that is the basis of our safety system, right? If you don't think that that a uh, test on a mouse or a test on a rat, uh, the safety, a safety demonstration by that method is going to uh, guarantee your safety, then you probably shouldn't be doing that method to ensure the safety of the public. Next slide, Hector. So the way that I want to interpret all this data, and it's not only the evidence that I've shown you today, this evidence comes from a lot of places it also comes from, um, uh, you know, the reason why we're interested in these papers is that, you know, most of my work is in GMOs. And we see the same pattern of EPA collusion with the industry, right? You can kind of, you know, if you meet these people and you see who goes to what meeting and why they go and what kind of information they take up, it's obvious that they have a very close relationship with the biotech industry. And so, uh, we were interested in these papers to see whether going back in time that was the historical relationship between EPA and the chemical industry. So what I want to suggest to you is that there's something other than what is normally called regulatory capture going on in this situation. Right? So, so regulatory capture is the idea that an industry basically has a stronger interest in influencing its regulator than the public does in, in defending itself against that regulator. Because the industry has, uh, basically its business model depends on uh, uh, basically having a compliant, complacent 
regulator, right? So they have money at their disposal and information at their disposal basically to bend the enforcement and so on of regulations in their favor. The other interpretation of the basically closed relationship between EPA and, uh, um, and the chemical companies is the idea of the revolving door. Right? The, revol the principle of the revolving door is that there are people placed inside these regulatory agencies who previously worked for the industry or are about to work for the industry who can influence decision making, right? influence enforcement, inf have all kinds of opportunities to move, uh, m move uh, the regulatory game in the direction, favorable direction for their future or past employer. I want to offer something a little different to that. So I'm just going to read this. So I want you to think, and it's all true, right, that EPA and its senior administrators serve at the behest of the president. That means the president can fire the head of EPA anytime he or she wants. That president does not want to be troubled by environmental concerns. If they are troubled by them, he or she is highly unlikely to take the side of the environment or public health, right? For, for apart from anything, they don't know anything about this subject. Therefore, the unwritten task of every EPA staff member is not to challenge a powerful applicant or powerful miscreant, but to bury any information that might embarrass them. The status of EPA officials is that is similar to that of authors who self-censor. Right? That is not in the interest, personal interest of any EPA official to raise a question about a product or a, uh, uh, you know, basically challenge anybody who's in Washington is powerful. So this doesn't, this theory does not apply to small operators. You know, I have friends who work for very small companies who are harassed mercilessly by the EPA about tiny infractions of the regulations and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is the exact opposite happens when, when it's Monsanto. Right? The EPA is a playground bully. So this self-censorship is nevertheless subtle in that by using pseudo-scientific arguments such as historical controls. So we saw the cobbled together controls right, that the EPA was using basically to salvage experiments of uh, IBTs. There are all these methods by which if you, uh, if, if, if a chemical company submits uh, information about the toxicity of a pesticide to the, to the EPA and there's some evidence that that toxin is harmful, right, in spite of all the fraud at the testing level, right, there's still evidence still comes forward to suggest that there is a carcinogenic effect, for example. What the EPA does, uh, and I'll, I'll be talking about this in my next talk, is what they do is they take that information and EPA basically makes excuses for, the, uh, for that chemical. Right? It basically takes the part of the chemical industry and it basically tries to think of, at an institutional level this is, tries to think of excuses of why this chemical should actually be an innocent actor when it's actually, the scientific evidence suggests otherwise. So, so the EPA will take, um, for example, if there's evidence of toxicologi toxicological effect against male rats but not female rats, EPA will say, well, that's inconsistent, right? Therefore, the toxicological information that we have must be somehow incorrect. Right? It's the harmless effect that is the meaningful one. So therefore, we will discard that data on the toxicological consequences of the male rats where there is an elevated level. So, so they will use arguments like this, and they use them over and over and over again until essentially a product gets a clean bill of health. And what I mean by elaborate administrative fixes is things like, which come out in the papers too, not sharing information with all the people who are supposed to be in the decision chain. Right? So you farm out one piece of the data to one person, and they kind of say, well, they come back to the sort of central point, and they say, well, it's not conclusive. And then you farm another part out to another person, and they inevitably come back and say, well, this is not conclusive. And you put the two bits together, which if both people had seen it, they would conclude that it was absolutely conclusive, but having not seen them, 
then they have to conclude that, and that decision is then passed upwards. Right? So you've got a whole series of opportunities which exist in the process and which it, it, the agency exploits to basically come up with findings of no harm for all these chemicals. Uh, next slide, please. So, and what this, what I would like to call the proactive collusion thesis, right? So basically, this, it's collusion, but it's kind of operating at a subtle level because these EPA administrators, they, they don't think of themselves as bad people, right? They don't think of themselves really as taking part, the part of the chemical industry. They think of themselves as realists, right? We're people who have a difficult decision to make and this evidence is always inconclusive, right? So they're preserving their ethical self-regard in this process, right? This is a very important part of the process that it's going through. So, so they, uh, they essentially are comfortable, for the most part, with these decisions that are being made. So using inappropriate controls and so on and so forth, they're comfortable with these decisions. So you get an internal culture which pervades the agency in which there's, there's very little whistleblowing. And when there is whistleblowing, it, it is done. Essentially, that person is unpopular within the agency because if you're going to believe what they say, then that portrays everybody else as unethical, uh, as unscientific, and so on and so forth. And what also our thesis explains is that the, and what comes out of the papers is this collusion that happens just on a routine level. Right? It doesn't require the specific intervention of a specific order from the center. Right? Everybody is doing it in this kind of subtle, or do you know, depending on their ethics and morals and scientific rigor and so forth, subtle or unsubtle level. But it's present in all these different parts of the agency. Right? It's because at the end of the day, the EPA can never challenge these big companies. And so, like, as I said, everyone knows that. Everyone in the agency understands that perfectly well. So what I want to suggest here is that uh, this thesis is, a, is an important contribution to academic theories of government. Right? The idea of, uh, of regulation is absolutely central to government. Right? You can't have government without it adjudicating between different interest groups in society. And existing theories of how that regulation comes about and, and how it is dealt with inside uh, administrations and so on and so forth is, uh, to me, it's an unsatisfactory debate, right? Because, uh, you know, there's a theory that regulatory capture is a, essentially a creation of right-wing economists, right? Right-wing economists basically and at the University of Chicago came up with this theory because they want to discredit regulation. They believe, presumably, in a kind of a free market. And so if they make a big argument about how regulation can never succeed by this theory of regulatory capture, which is never particularly well explained, then, then, the, um, then essentially you discredit the concept of regulation. You undermine it at an academic and conceptual level. So, just, I'm just summarizing here, really, that the traditional view of regulation is adversarial, and that registrants, registrants fight for the approval or, or have their own interests, and that regulators defend that interest. And there are complications of the story of revolving doors. There are complications of uh, a regulatory capture, but this is essentially what is going on, and we're offering what amounts to a second thesis, right? an alternative to that model. Now, this is not a denial of the revolving door or, or that other things are going on, but we think that this is a very important component of the regulatory process. So, but there are remedies, right? We can support whistleblowers, which at the moment we, we often do not do. Uh, we can also make regulators independent of the presidency. Right? If you think about the different branches of government, they have different dependencies on the president. They have, you know, between the Supreme Court and the, the head of the Federal Reserve Bank, for example, and, and the heads of different agencies, they have different levels of job security, 
right, that enable them to make different decisions independent of the political system. But if you look at the way the EPA is set up, right, who set up the EPA? Richard Nixon, at the height of concerns over uh, uh, DDT and under attack from Rachel Carson and environmentalists and so forth, Richard Nixon knew how to administrate a problem away. Right? He understood that if you create an agency that is basically a barrier between the chemical companies and the public, and you collect together all its separate parts into one agency, and, and you tell a story about how it's going to function, then you can basically uh, destroy the environmental movement. Right? That was the intention of it. And, uh, and, so, and he understood that if you take an agency and you combine in it rulemaking and enforcement functions, for example, that you would normally keep separate, right? In the normal course of political events, you have your, uh, you know, if you're committed, if, you, uh, if, if you've committed a, uh, a many types of crimes, there is a separate, there's a legal, you know, there's a basically a set of laws that are formulated by one jurisdiction, one sort of uh, government entity there is the police force that then goes and picks you up and, and, uh, and, and uh, may prosecute you. And then there's a judicial system that will then uh, pronounce on the adequacy of the prosecution and so on and so forth. Right? So you can separate out these functions or you can collect them together in one agency and provide all kinds of opportunities for corruption and self-interest and self-dealing and so forth. Right? And so that's what Richard Dixon did. So, and if you, you know, we'll get into this. This is some of the, uh, there's some um, information I've put uh, out about um, the usefulness, about the possibilities of chemical regulation in the first place, right? If even if you have, you know, we if, imagine we so, we implement these changes and we solve all those problems and we have an honest regulator doing their level best to protect us against toxic chemicals, they still have to answer two important questions, right? Is there such a thing as a safe chemical? Right? What would happen if the regulator finds itself to be effective and then it ends up banning everything? Right? There's no such thing as a safe chemical. You know, the neonicotinoids, BPA, uh, phthalates, you know, I can make a very long list for you of things that were once thought to be safe and now uh, thought not to be. So, so this is the question that will come up. Right? The second question that will, come, that will come up is the question of, is science in principle capable of actually distinguishing a safe from an unsafe chemical? Right? Just because you've done a test for carcinogenicity does not mean that that, that chemical is uh, safe for your brain or safe for your, will not give you diabetes or will not give you, uh, you know, any number of other dysfunctions. Right? In future generations, under different conditions, uh, so on and so forth. Right? This is a very complicated question, right? It's not solved by one or two rat studies or one or two examinations of organisms from the succeeding generation. What happens if it takes three generations for toxicological effects to become evident, right? These are not simple questions, but we treat them in our society as if they are. And, and this is uh, an error. So, uh, next slide, please. So I was asked to talk a little bit about genome editing and uh, some future DNA, potentially future DNA technologies. So this is more uh, closer to my background. So I'm a molecular biologist by training. And there, is, you know, there are many hours that I could, in fact, spend talking about the politics, for example, of uh, gene-edited organisms because gene-edited organisms, uh, because they're not only not limited to agricultural products, in the case, for example, of uh, gene drives, they have potential military, international, and democratic uh, implications, right? So, for example, democratic implications would be that you, you, know, you will find these organisms growing in your back garden, and maybe you don't want them. International ones would be, or other, other countries, jurisdictions will find these organisms growing in their, in their, in their nation states who uninvited. So, and then there are military implications, right? One of the biggest funders of 
gene editing and gene drives is the, is the military, right? The especially DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Products Agency. So, so there are all kinds of groups taking interest in these novel editing technologies. I could also talk about the technical details, and I will do that in one of my uh, other talks. We could also talk about the hazards and the risks, right? But there is a problem talking about hazards and risks in that in many cases, as the legislation currently stands, we are not likely to know what these products are, right? There is no requirement uh, for, in this country, for having those pass through the regulatory system. There is also no requirement to label it. So, so essentially, we're in a situation at which uh, people even now, our companies even now, are bringing products to market which we don't actually know how they were made, right? So which makes it very difficult for me to tell you anything concrete about the hazards and risks of those plants. Uh, and we could talk about the applications. We could also talk about the public relations and media blitz, right? What actually is editing, right? Uh, and we could also talk about patents and commerce. So, so these, and science and regulation, uh, the, thing, the document that I'd like to draw your attention to, to do with science and regulation, is, uh, is a paper I wrote, um, which is basically arguing that, that gene drives cannot be scientifically regulated. In the kind of extension of the argument that they made to you about chemicals, if we failed as a society to regulate the safe use of sim relatively simple things like individual chemicals which don't reproduce and have a half-life and disappear from the environment in due course for the most part, then how are we going to regulate living organisms which represent many-fold increase in complexity? Can we have the next slide? So, and then genome editing is of interest to people in many, many spheres of human life. They, it is of interest for medical uses, for example, and that includes these top two categories. There's also applications in, in agriculture where we have uh, domesticated animals. You know, at the moment there's very few, uh, there's a GMO salmon. Right? It's basically the only GMO animal in, uh, in agriculture. Uh, but gene editing offers the possibility of producing others. The, uh, the, one of the huge extensions of gene editing is the use of genetic engineering technologies in uh, basically on wild species, right? Well, genetic engineering so far has basically been confined to agricultural crops with the sort of pretense that they don't spread anywhere, right? And there are exceptions to this. There's creeping bent grass, there are invasive oilseed rapes and so forth that have crossed national boundaries and, and cause, cause trouble, uh, mainly to farmers. but uh, but these are organisms that are deliberately intended to, to live out and die out in the wild and have different traits. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little point about genome editing, right? The, the word editing is a, uh, is a metaphor, right? We don't actually have the capacity to do what's shown in these pictures, right? These, these uh, pictures from the popular media have uh, basically, um, they're riffing off the idea of editing to imply that you can change a single base pair of an organism uh, more or less at will and, uh, and limit your in intended intervention to that. Now we do not ha actually have the capability of doing that. The word editing implies that we do, you know, it's mere copy editing, but it's actually not possible. We have uh, enzymes which can cut DNA very precisely, but they can't necessarily do it at the place that you want. Right? We have enzymes that can cut DNA uh, at the place that you want, but they can't do it very precisely. Right? So we have basically those two technologies in play. And the closest visually to, uh, to the actual likely reality of genome editing is this one here, in which you have a cut to the DNA and various nucleotides flying off in random directions because it's not a precise cut.
So can we have the next slide? Now, I could go into many of these technical details, but actually I want to talk about the paradigm. I want to talk about the biological logic, the overarching biological logic of changing DNA in order to change organisms. Now, the sort of basic, basic understanding of many biological textbooks, many biologists, many uh, the understanding of this past to the public about the nature of biology is that uh, DNA is kind of the central organizing principle of biology and function follows from the operation of that DNA. And this is the famous central dogma that was formulated quite soon after the discovery of DNA. Excuse me. And, and it kind of encouraged scientists to think about biology in this way. But it's a self-serving metaphor. Right? It places DNA at the beginning of a sequence of events that end in uh, protein-mediated functions. And as if nothing preceded the existence of that DNA. Can we have the next slide? So actually, quite a lot of things preceded the existence of that DNA, including the decision to make that DNA in the first place. So DNA is made of nucleotides. In order to form DNA, those nucleotides have to be linked together by proteins. So you've got a whole series of events. Those nucleotides, for example, need to be synthesized by the plant, by the organism. So the, uh, there's parts that precede this as well. That DNA probably needs to be degraded somewhere at some point in its life. Uh, and the same uh, operation occurs when DNA is used as a template to produce RNA, and when RNA is used as a template to produce protein. So proteins are the sort of functional, in many ways, the functional part of organisms. So proteins provide structural features, they provide physical uh, movement features of the cell, they provide uh, enzyme functions, they provide signaling functions, they, they provide uh, many, many of the, the actual living properties that you will notice about an organism. And in order to produce those proteins, you need this whole system here. You need uh, proteins of another kind to produce those proteins, and you need amino acids. Next slide. So, and going wider, you need a cell, right? You need a boundary for that organism in order to provide the conditions of energy and nutrients and water in order for this system to function at all, right? So, uh, what, what the central dogma does is it produces a very narrow, linear version of that of biology, which is actually factually incorrect. You also need, uh, if you, uh, um, if this is an animal cell, the animal cell also needs amino acids, or it's almost escaped off the edge of the slide, an animal cell actually needs amino acids, right? The, the essential amino acids that you need in your diet are the ones that are needed to supply the, needed to build the proteins that this DNA, according to the to the, um, the central dogma model is producing. Next slide. So you have an organism, right? And it, this organism does not anyway have a center, right? There's a fundamental error in even calling it the central anything, right? Because essentially all this functionality is distributed all over the entire organism. The leaves of this organism are providing certain functions. The trunk is providing other functions. The roots are providing other functions. There is in biology actually no center of anything, regardless of the organism. Right? It doesn't matter whether it's an elephant or a butterfly or a flower or a bacterium. There is actually fundamentally no center. Next slide. This is a much closer and more accurate model of an organism. Right? Organisms are actually systems. They are not genetically organized uh, creatures. 
they are um, so a high, highly complex self-organized system is a system like for example the internet or the weather or even a cloud right? if you watch a cloud and it goes across the sky you'll see that it's continually forming it's unforming and reforming all the time and that is how organisms are we don't notice that function partly because we're trained not to notice that aspect of an organism but you're breathing you're eating on a daily basis in order to sustain that biological activity that goes on inside you. You are self-organizing based on the energy and the nutrient inputs that you are taking in on a daily basis. If I come and talk to you in a year's time, all of my molecules will be different. Right? I'll be the same person because I'm self-organizing. I may even have the same mole on my neck or whatever, but the molecules involved in that will all be different. Right? So the organism, we don't think about organism. We're so trained in this biological uh, mindset of science the, to, to see organisms as static and as non-dynamic objects that we don't see this process function that we all have. So if we want to think about organisms as systems, there are uh, two-way connections between the part, subparts of the organism, two-way connections between the subparts of the organ and the, the, its subparts, and so on and so forth. And there's connections that you, you could draw between the tissues, and the tissues also talk to each other. Right? It's not, the interactions between them are not limited to the ones I've drawn in this picture. Uh, the cell, sometimes the cell will, will determine the functions of an organism, or play a role in the causation of effects in that organism. So the organism has, this is not a denial of the fact that organisms have DNA, right? What I'm trying to do is stop you from privileging DNA as a mechanism of causation in an organism, right? There are mechanisms of causation that operate within the organism. There are mechanisms of causation that operate upwards Right? For example, the force of gravity right? has an important causative effect on your life. The wind, right? <laughs> as it comes from outside of you, has an important effect sometimes on the cause of your life. The uh, culture, for example, affects how organisms function. So you have all these forces that are affecting the functioning of organisms which themselves are self-organizing. One of the properties, for example, it's not easy to define in a simple way what is a self-organizing system, but uh, non-living ones, for example, would be things like the internet or the economy or, um, uh, or, or the weather, for example. So these are things for which there's no center. But you don't need to posit a center to those things in order to imagine that they function perfectly well. Right? But we posit a center to the functioning of organisms basically for no biological reason at all. It's, it's entirely uh, a socially constructed. Right? It's a fiction. Uh, next slide, Hector. So just a little more about systems. So here's a definition of uh, systems from uh, two famous biologists so they're famous, in a sense, as alternative biologists. Right? These people are well known in their own fields, but they also are not part of the mainstream. Right? The mainstream is essentially the central dogma. Right? It's genetic determinist type, uh, type theory. But what they're suggesting here is not that the whole is more than the sum of the parts, but that the parts acquire new properties. But as the parts acquire new properties, by being together, they impart to the whole new properties which are reflected in the changes in the parts, and so on. So you have this whole interaction between these parts, which essentially is a function of the system itself, and cannot actually, in principle, be broken down into the subparts. And the relationship evolves. You can posit a whole theory of evolution, which basically has as its center the organism. Most theories of evolution 
talk about the mutations in DNA and the importance of the mutations in proteins and so on and so forth, but you can reconfigure the entire theory of evolution around system level biology and point out the fact that the actual thing that lives and dies in, in the, in, under the theory of natural selection is the whole organism. Right? That is what's responding to, the, to natural selection. So you, don't, you can basically unprivileged DNA. We've de we privilege DNA in our theories of evolution. But there's no logical, uh, ultimately, re uh, ultimate reason for that. Can I have the next slide? Huh. OK, go back. Well, I'm just about the end. But so what I want to talk to you about, just very briefly, <clears throat> is ask the question, why do we posit this, uh, this organism, this complex, complex of, of uh, interrelated parts, why do we interpret it as a, uh, in a reductionistic way? Right? Why do we take an organism and without basically any evidence imply that all the causation comes from below? Right? Why, why do we do that as a science? Why do we do that as a society? And there's some interesting questions, answers to that question, excuse me. Uh, one of them that I'm going to suggest to you tonight is that if you, if you posit that causation comes from a place that ordinary people cannot see, you generate, this is a source of power. Right? If I postulate to you that I have some inside knowledge about how you function, or how the ecosystem functions, or how all organisms function, then I know something about you that you do not. Right? Imagine that I'm the government. Right? Imagine that I have a piece of your DNA. Right? Imagine that I've sequenced that DNA, and I've come up with a theory about how organisms are determined by their DNA, and that I can tell you more about you than you know yourself. Right? I can basically label you, for example, as a, uh, somebody who's going to have a high IQ, or somebody who's going to end up in prison, or somebody who is going to be an elite member of society, for example. I, this, what, what science has done okay, is take information that is available and basically discard what we think we know about organisms and focus its interest on different aspects of the organism that then can be used to generate power in our, <clears throat> me, in our society. So, so essentially, that's what has happened in the development of biology over the last 100 years. So essentially, the government now is in the, in the uh, position <clears throat> of, for example, let me give you a, a short example. The most influential biologist in the, the government system in Britain is a guy called Richard Plowman. And he, he has argued that in, short, in a short space of time, we will be able to reproduce, uh, re, sorry, replace uh, educational testing with genetic testing. Okay? He believes that essentially your DNA determines your intelligence. Right? And so, so we are now moving towards the situation where the government is now able to basically make the kinds of decisions that I was just talking about and make them on our behalf, right? As to where, kind of, what kind of institutions we ought to belong in, in or not. So we have, and, there's, and I'm suggesting to you, there's a good reason why this biologist is the most influential biologist in the government, right? Because the government likes what it hears from this biologist. And it becomes irrelevant whether what this biologist says is actually true, right? You have a situation in which uh, the various people are telling the government, we can control organisms through their DNA, right? And the biotech industry is telling investors they can control organisms through their DNA. And so they're using these claims to generate huge amounts of hype, generate huge amounts of money, but these claims will not end up being true, right? If you worry about gene editing and so on and so forth, 
you, you shouldn't worry about it in terms of whether these claims will come to be true because organisms don't work according to the way gene editing, the hype of gene editing would have you believe. They don't work that way. That doesn't mean that bad things cannot happen at the same time, but it means that people will make a lot of claims about those organisms, including yourself, about and, 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 and that will generate them for themselves money and power. So if you think of the way this works out is if you think about the genetic engineering revolution, right? The genetic engineering revolution made all kinds of claims about wonderful things that were going to happen through biotechnology in agriculture. What actually happened was that the, the chemical, the, the biotech industry developed, for the most part, uh, insect resistant plants. It developed herbicide resistant crops, a small number of other uh, crops. But essentially, the claims that of a huge revolution in agriculture, that everything was going to get better, power would be distributed to more farmers, and the farmers would become rich, and so on and so forth. None of these things happened. And the reason they didn't happen is because the paradigm was wrong. Right? The paradigm was incorrect. It was never likely to happen. You cannot, cannot in fact, con control organisms uh, which have operate on this system just by changing their DNA. But what the companies do right, is, is they create the illusion that they are doing, they're operating according to this logic. So this is a very important thing to understand. When a company makes a GMO, they take uh, probably, they will make 5,000 different GMOs. And all those GMOs will function differently because they've, you know, they've messed around with the genome, the, gene, the DNA they've added has ended up in different places. All of those organisms will function differently. They're, they're full of mutations. All those organisms function differently. But they will select one that they will then claim to the farmers, to the public, to the regulators, it operates according to the system that they have, uh, that they posited at the beginning, which is that this is a genetic control by their single transgene to create a single result, right? But what it really is is a selection from 5,000 organisms that actually, uh, none of which functioned really according to the way the company expected, right? If it was really true that that the paradigm could just generate a, uh, a, a precise change and result in a pre precise result, then the companies will need to make one GMO, right? But they don't. They're selecting from thousands. And one of my favorite biotech stories is, is uh, some researchers who they developed, uh, they wanted to develop a virus-resistant plant. And so they, they, you know, they did their transformation. They had the, their gene that was supposed to give resistance, and they put it into the plant, and they, they transformed thousands of cells, and they put the, planted up a whole field with plants. And one of them was resistant to the virus. And they, they were excited until they sequenced the DNA and discovered that it didn't have the transgene in at all. Right? And so... So, so this is the, the understanding I want to share with you about the gene editing revolution. The bad things can happen, right? The, the, the development of herbicide-resistant crops has led to uh, the devastation of having basically clean fields in which very few organisms can actually live, right? This is the devastation for the environment, right? Devastations to the environment can happen whether or not the paradigm is correct, right? the disappearance of the monarch, so on and so forth. These, these you know, extremely negative outcomes can still transpire, but it's not because the, of the paradigm, right? It's because of whole kinds of different things that are operating within the system, including the laxity of regulators in not restricting the spraying of Roundup and atrazine, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So I'm going to stop at that point. I want to, uh, the next slide, Hector, I want to, do some thank yous. So, so um, these are uh, various board members and volunteers who have helped us in this project. Uh, and I also, I want to uh, highlight Alison Wilson here has been my partner in all this, in all this work for the entire uh, time that we've existed. And I encourage you to visit our website, Independent Science News, and our nonprofit 
and the Poison Papers, and also subscribe to our uh, website. So we have a place where you can sign up and get uh, updates, which don't come very often, uh, but, um, but which can kind of help you inform, you know, learn about our new thinking about some of these new technologies. So I'm going to stop there. I've probably gone on. I don't actually have any clue what the time is. So I hope I haven't gone on too long. But uh, I'd welcome any questions if people have an in interest. So thank you. <clears throat>Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, that was a really enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, I think the main recording for the video is the, the primary mic. So mm -hmm. if there's questions, perhaps you can repeat them. Uh, That'd be okay. Great idea. Okay, great. That, that's great. There's a question here, yeah. In terms of the regulatory, um, the first part of your presentation and how you ended that, that was with remedies. And I'm just wondering, I'm thinking of atrazine and Syngenta and they cannot spray it in uh, Switzerland. I, I don't know if that's a Swiss thing or a, yeah. an EU thing, but- It's an so, EU thing, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering what, what do, what are they doing, you know, or what are some other examples of regulatory um, things around the world that might take some of these chemicals off the shelf? That might? Take, uh, prevent the chemicals from being sold in that country. So what's happening, you know, what's shaping it in the U.S. that is shaped differently in some other places? Um. I mean, the number one difference, right, is, is explained by our thesis, right, that, that a regulator needs the political cover, right, to perform their job, right? If they're going to ban products, they need to know that the, that the, the, the leaders, the officials, the government, will actually support them in that action. And so the reason, the primary reason why uh, regulation is more effective and m more chemicals are banned, why more, there's more action on the endocrine disruptors and so on and so forth. The reason why there's more of this activity is that those regulators have that cover. They don't have complete cover, right? It's very obvious that some, uh, the, the European Union was not very enthusiastic to, to find out that glyphosate might well be turned down by the nation states. I mean, what, what was really interesting to me about the, the whole glyphosate debate in the European Union was that uh, the European Commission kind of oversees the decision. So national, nation states are supposed to make the decision. And there was basically a split. So there was, you know, countries like Austria, Italy, France were behind a ban. Countries like, uh, um, Germany was kind of sitting on the fence. Then there was countries like Britain and Spain who uh, did not offer that political, they were not considering that to be a, a good option. What the European uh, Commission did, right, was there was a date set for a vote. And what the European Commission did was when they saw that they were gonna get the wrong result, as far as they were concerned from that discussion, they canceled the discussion and allowed more time for their, uh, their interest, their preference to prevail. Right? So they didn't really play an even-handed role in that. But never, nevertheless, there is a reasonable, uh, you know, there's a, there's a much better, more positive political situation in the European Union. Now, it is also true that there is a lot of dialogue between the EPA, the European regulators, and the companies on both sides of the Atlantic, those companies are attempting to influence regulation around the world. And so they are, they are playing on the insecurities and so forth of these regulators to push their ideas, right? So I go to regulatory conferences of toxic chemicals and you see the, the, the companies basically trying to provide the, the ideas the intellectual content, 
that will allow the European regulators to get together and make decisions that favor their products. Right? So they will, they will come up with regulatory schemes you know, which are extremely complicated about how you should regulate uh, toxic uh, uh, GMOs for non-target organisms. So in agriculture, all these GMOs are, you know, they're getting into the water supply and they're getting into the, into the soil and they're getting into all these places in very large amounts. And so the companies came up with this regulatory system which, when you broke it down, never generated a no answer. Right? It sounds absurd that anybody would, would, would adopt their system, but essentially that is, the, that is the default position of the regulatory agencies at the moment. But they came up with that idea because they were offered it by the chemical industry that co-opted a certain small group of scientists, and then that becomes the kind of the consensus. Right? So be, in science, be very wary of the idea of consensus. But so so you know, political cover, the whole, uh, you know, I think that what we offer is a constructive contribution to that, to that discussion. Uh, <clears throat> a question on the EPA. Um, I appreciated your exposition uh, or explanation, however you want to say it, of Richard Nixon's creation of the EPA and how it was little more than a subterfuge to, um, sabotage the environmental movement. Um, and I was thinking about some of the previous EPA administrators. Uh, of course, during the Reagan administration, you had Ann Gorsuch, the mother of our present uh, Supreme Court member that um, was appointed by Trump. And today, uh, I guess it's who's the new boss, same as the old boss. We had Scott Pruitt, and apparently his conduct was so reprehensible that even members, uh, the people that were in the EPA were in, you know, rebellion against him. Yeah. So is, was this an aberration that was occurring in this situation? Because you said usually there's this regulatory capture or however you want to characterize it, but in this case, they did rebel against him. Was this an aberration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So, um, was this an aberration? The, the answer is yes and no, right? Well, on the one hand, it's an aberration in that Donald Trump did not know how to play the game, right? So the game is to, pro to propose someone who is a plausible, environmentalist at the top of the EPA to preserve the image of an agency operating in the favor of the public, right? I, I don't actually think that the chemical industry and the, the, uh, petrol, the petroleum industry was very enthusiastic to see uh, Pruitt being the head of the EPA because he kind of disturbs the delicate equilibrium. They have an agency which basically works for them, but they must maintain the fiction that it doesn't work for them, right? In order for the whole system to work, they have to rail against the EPA and fulminate about its overreach and its, and its over-enthusiasm for and captured by environmentalists, right, who it never actually meets. And, and, and the, so they have to maintain this kind of a stance, right? And Donald Trump, you know, was taken in by the play-acting Right? and said, you know, I'll step this in with his genius plan of stepping in to put it all right. But really, those companies won the fiction. Okay? But the other group who wants that fiction is the employees at the EPA. Right? They're, not necessar they're, they're not necessarily Trump supporters, and they see that, that uh, you know, they, are, they are themselves are not comfortable with having Donald Trump, but they would not, you know, I don't think they would agree with my, you know, only, the only, the, the people at EPA who, who would agree with my analysis are people who are internal whistleblowers under a normal situation, right? These people are whistleblowing and, and rebelling against Donald Trump because it's a slightly abnormal situation in which they are actually being asked to do things that they normally, 
uh, would not feel comfortable doing. So, so my interpretation of this is basically that, that it is an aberration and it's not. It's kind of the exception, I would argue, that proves the rule of what's really going on here. Dr. Leighton, uh, first of all, an aside to say that collusion is not a crime. So I don't see what's the big problem with the, with the beginning of your thesis. Uh, but apart from that, and I didn't get any laughter from anybody, so I guess, but <laughs> um, how does the thesis of another famous Englishman fit into your premise here? I'm talking about Richard Dawkins, uh, mm. Selfish Gene. Mm. So, well, I mean, Richard Dawkins is the, I'm not quite sure, just to answer the first part of your question, I, I hope I didn't say that pollution is not a problem. I, is that what I heard you say? Oh, Trump is not a problem. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, just to go back to Richard Dawkins. Right? Richard Dawkins is the archetype of the central dogma type biologist, right? He, he described organisms as lumbering robots, right? As basically automatons run by their DNA, right? That's how he thought about it. And that, that idea of biology is an idea that, in my opinion, most biologists do not actually, in my experience, most biologists do not actually hold that idea. They're much closer to it than they think they are, but most biologists would not, you know, they, they, they have a reasonable understanding that biology is not just about DNA. But, you know, these are friends, you know, I have biologists who work at Cornell and have friends and so on and so forth. And, you know, when I lay out this thesis, they say, well, we don't believe that DNA controls everything. We, you know, we have a, quite a sophisticated understanding. There are cells that are complex systems and so on and so forth. But they have uh, what... What, what's characteristic about my friends who are biologists is they're not at the top of biology, right? They're not super famous biologists. They don't rise up in the system and become darlings of the media, right? For example, the ones who become darlings of the media are people like Steven Pinker, Richard Dawkins, uh, 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 Robert Plumin, who I mentioned earlier and his thesis about how we wouldn't need entrance exams for, for schools and so on and so forth. These are the biologists that the media and the political establishment pick out to do their reductionistic work for them. They are the ones being promoted, right? Because the establishment, you know, even though uh, you may think at present it's ridiculous to imagine that Richard Plumin's ideas will become reality, I would say to you, if you read the signs, and you know how to read them, this is the way that we are going. Into this genetic, determinist, decision-making system in which uh, science essentially is doing a power grab, right? In the same way as I described to you, Richard Dawkins is constructing scientific hypotheses that basically remove the power from you to know about your own self and transfers that power to corporations and to gov <coughs> governments. Anyone who has a copy of your DNA and has a scientific thesis for interpreting what that DNA means. Right? So they, they basically, you know, they will read the scientific literature and they'll say, you have this particular sequence of ACs, Gs, and Ts, and you don't belong in the highest ranks of academia, you belong in prison, you belong in, in a mental institution, or, or whatever it is. We're moving towards that place. And so Richard Dawkins, you know, he's a famous biologist, but there's, there's, there's a lot of subtleties to what is going on here. But, you know, my ultimate argument is that Richard Dawkins is the, you know, arguably the Robert Plumlee, the wrongest biologist in, 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 in the whole of science, but they're also close to the center, right? They represent the, the, uh, the kind of ascendant view 
the one that science is working towards because it sees that position as being, as, it's a self-serving position, right, on the part of science. That, that if you, the more genetic determinist you are, the more, the more power you accumulate as a scientific decision maker. Right? If you think about the, the systems view of an organism, a biotech company manipulating an organism, if everybody understands that the organism is a system, that biotech company, the stock is going to collapse. Right? Because it's hard to envisage a way in which that biotech company is actually going to make any money when it can't generate organisms that behave in predictable ways. So, so there's a whole power structure that is bound up in this way of thinking that is causing the establishment to fund this kind of genetic biology. And it's existed for a hundred years or so. So if you, uh, what I'll talk about on Maui a little bit is that, uh, you know, the construction of this biology, it is laid out in a book called, um, I'm going to blank on the name. The author is called Lily Kay, and uh, it's called The Molecular Vision of Life. And it's basically the Rockefeller Foundation. They were eugenicists. And what they did was they invested in the science of molecular biology in the 1920s. They basically, they theorized, if you're a eugenicist, what that means to you is that there are little molecules, and nobody knew that this molecule would be DNA, but there is something at the center of your being that determines your properties, right? Your social graces, your, uh, your IQ, your criminality, so on and so forth. And they, they postulated, long before really anybody else, that if they, if they went to search for that property, of organisms that they would be able to control those organisms. That was their logic. And so, so they basically they invented the word. The word molecular biology was first used by somebody who worked for the Rockefeller Foundation. They, they invented that science in order to do that work for themselves. So they created this as a political strategy. It was not an inadvertent collapse of the holistic paradigm of organisms that existed more, you know, more or less up to that point. It was a deliberate, they deliberately undermined that worldview in order to create a, view, a, a version of biology that served their political purposes. <coughs> purposes sorry. So, um, hi. As a far Virologist, can you talk about the hidden viral gene in the GMO papaya? Sure. So, um, you know, this is something that was discovered by, the, by scientists who work for EFSA, so the European Food Safety Authority. Um, they were asked to, uh, take, to take existing GMOs and work out whether they had open reading frames in that. An open reading frame is basically a sequence of DNA that is likely to code for a protein. So, you know, the belated, the belated thought of the regulators is that maybe all these GMO, GMOs that we're approving are producing proteins that we haven't kind of twigged yet, right? And they, they didn't find that many, but they did find that the cauliflower mosaic virus promoter, which, the, which companies were using, uh, does actually contain a sequence of DNA that codes for uh, a fair, fairly big proportion of a protein, it's more than 50% of, of a small protein that, uh, that the cauliflower mosaic virus makes as part of its normal function. So that, uh, it's not a complete version of that protein. But uh, it is potentially produced by those GMO plants. And uh, what's kind of alarming about this protein is that that protein is um, 
uh, it's a viral protein, right? It comes from a pathogen. The point of viral pathogens is to do things like take out the immune system, to spread a the virus in more different places, to basically derail the defense functions of that plant. And that, uh, the protein that was produced, uh, or potential, the protein that was potentially produced by the cauliflower mosaic virus promoter actually had some of these functions. It was known to, uh, to interfere with the plant immune system, for example. So uh, this does not prove that it's produced inside the plant, but it, it was enough to alarm the regulators. It was enough to alarm us. The regulators actually published this analysis, and they came to a different conclusion than we did. Right? The regulators came to the conclusion that was nothing, no harm would result from the, even if this protein was expressed. But uh, we reached a different conclusion. I'm a virologist, and I, we did a separate analysis of their publication. Right? So they, the, the European regulator published it in a place where basically it would be buried, right? where no one would ever see this publication. And, but it just happened across my desk, and so I looked at it, and I knew immediately what gene they were talking about. And so I had some inkling that it actually would be interesting. So, so, I, um, so, so we basically wrote this up, and subsequently the European Union has uh, done, done a little bit of analysis on the possibilities that this cauliflower mosaic virus, which is present, present by the way, in, in the majority of GMOs, uh, that this pro they looked at one GMO in particular, uh, just randomly chosen, and they showed that actually uh, there was an RNA sequence that crossed over the promoter that could potentially cause that protein to be expressed. So, so you know, the, we don't have a proof that this protein is produced. We don't have a proof that actually harmful consequences are happening in these GMOs, but uh, it may just be a question of that the experiments have not been done, right? The, they're not, the European Union appears not to be interested. Having, having done a test, having done a test and shown that there were transcripts going across this region and therefore it may well be produced, they then declined to go any further. And this is, this is what you see in science quite often is there are predetermined answers that some people, you know, the establishment wants certain answers and not others, and you can see them coming, right? You can, you can, you can tell that, that, that the expression of this, the demonstrated expression of that protein in a GMO crop would be a bad thing to be happening on several levels, not only because of its effects on the plant immune system. So, so having positively, positively identified the next logical step as being, uh, as being a hazard, they didn't, they've done nothing more in, in the meantime. So, and I would encourage them, if they watch this video, to go and uh, do that next step and see whether the protein is detectable in any GMO crops. And, uh, and, and, uh, but it will be interesting, sure, surely, if, if that was. Because, I mean, one of the things about this protein, too, is that there are proteins that interfere with the plant immune system that also interfere. This, this is basically the plants and animals uh, have, in some respects, similar immune systems. You can take proteins that inhibit the plant. This is, we're talking about the RNA, RNA interference type of immune system. This is not antibodies. This is a different kind of immune system. But plants and animals, actually, there are, there are certain uh, proteins from viruses that you can take from an animal virus, and it will inhibit, inhibit the plant immune system. Right? And probably that happens the, both ways around. Right, because these systems are so similar to each other, they, they originate from before the separation of plants and animals. And so, so this, uh, the, the existence of this protein is potentially a public health threat. Right? It's not only that it may derail the plant's immune system and cause that plant to have uh, infections that, that the farmers don't want, it's also that it's potentially a human toxin. Does that answer your question in enough detail? We're starting to run out of time, but uh, we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, I'll try to make the question short if the answer can be short. Um, you've told us a lot about how complicated biological systems are and about agriculture uh, being a very complex thing. Um, 
there is probably no single way of growing things perfectly. There are going to be pluses and minuses. There are going to be risks and benefits uh, to any way that food's produced, especially in a, a large, complicated culture. You've told us a lot about your perceived risks to conventional agriculture and biotechnology. You haven't talked very much about the benefits, but um, it's always a risk-benefit analysis that should go into deciding how things are done. But there's room for all kinds of, of production methodologies. And I'd like to know more about what your vision of production is and what we should be working toward rather than just what's wrong with what we're doing now. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, when I buy food, I buy uh, food from people I know. I try to make sure it's local. I try to make sure that things haven't been sprayed on it. I try to make sure that it comes from a competent farmer. You know, there's, there's many degrees and of competency of farming. Uh, so those, those are things that meet my personal needs. There are, uh, you know, these same methods of farming can, in my opinion, very easily feed the world. There's no, <clears throat> there's no question about that. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean that organic farming is risk-free. For example, you know, organic farmers use uh, products that are controversial, even among themselves. Uh, there are plant varieties that occasionally excuse me, have turned out to be uh, problematic, for example. Uh, you can have organic farming done under um, situations of too much animal crowding, where there are opportunities for diseases to build up, for pollution to build up. So, uh, you know, I, I totally agree there's no panacea, but I see no... Uh, it's very hard to see any great role for industrialized agriculture, in my view. So industrialized agriculture is, you know, is removing uh, people from the land. It is removing, it is expand, making farms bigger. It is growing uh, crops as monocultures, which basically encourages disease. It is, uh, it is basically making life difficult for the farmer. It's a make-work scheme in many cases. Right? It generates profits for the chemical industry because you know if you grow if you grow corn or soybeans just micrometers apart those plants are going to be weaker than they need to be and so they will basically be susceptible to diseases and people who have uh, more sensible farming systems would set about things in a different way and i don't you know i don't see any alternative for the future of the planet than to see basically agribusiness disappear. And I personally would like to see uh, you know, many more people on the land. I believe that there is room on the land for a lot of employment that we don't currently have or have recently lost. And so there are all these opportunities in small-scale agriculture. And I also, uh, politically, uh, you know, I'm kind of a Jeffersonian in the sense that I would like to see small landholders in, on their own land where they can actually assert their political rights. Right? So there's a political dimension to farming and land holding which basically ensures the independence of the population. If you move the uh, population, you know, the other project of the Rockefellers was basically to move the population to the cities, right, off of the land so that those people could become compliant consumers. Right? And so you, know, you feed the oil industry, you feed the chemical industry, but you deprive those people of their political rights. You know, in the, in the civil rights era, for example, uh, some of the political energy from that civil rights movement came from areas where there were strong land holdings by African-American people, for example. For the simple reason that, that those African-Americans supporting the civil rights movement could not simply be fired, right, by their bosses. You know, if you work in the hardware store and you were known to vote for a certain politician or help some person, you could be fired and you lose your, your uh, you know, some fundamental needs, your ability to meet your needs for yourself and your family. 
So, so you know, I don't, this, is, this is part of the nexus of agriculture thing, right? Is the political part of it too. So does that help answer your question? Hi, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I guess what I got out of it is we just can't trust scientists. Um, I guess I had one, my, my biggest question is, uh, you know, you're talking about some of the, the imprecise genetic modification techniques like the CRISPR-Cas9 and that, but you didn't mention anything about, say, mutation breeding, um, mm -hmm. which I would argue is much, much more imprecise, but it's widely accepted in, in both conventional and organic agriculture. Um, why is that not getting the attention? Uh, I, I would say CRISPR-Cas9 is going to be a, you know, a thousand times more precise than, than say, bombarding with neutrons. Just, just to answer your last question, I will, I will, uh, I'm hoping to talk about this uh, at one of the other talks, but, um, you know, the issue with, um, with genetic engineering of crops is that it is, it is very damaging to, to the genome of a plant to have a particle pass into the nucleus of the cell, to go, have it go through a very uh, kind of intrusive form of tissue culture where you reduce the organism to a single cell. And there's a highly mutagenic process. Uh, there's also sometimes mutagens involved in the antibiotics. There are mutagens, uh, you know, you've got to basically, you know, what we see with insertion events, right, is that uh, if, you, if you use particle bombardment to make a GMO, that particle is you coated it in your DNA of choice. It comes into the cell, and on its way into the cell, it probably will pass through a chloroplast. It will pick up DNA from that chloroplast, and then it will arrive in the nucleus, and it will damage the chromosomes to some extent, and that damage is repaired by the cell in the best way that it can which is basically to take DNA from where it can find it to basically restore the integrity of the genome and the chromosome. So what it ends up doing is often as not repairing that insertion event with DNA from the chloroplast, DNA from uh, you know, other parts of the damage caused by that particle passing through the cell, uh, either from the nucleus uh, and then use it, inserting often multiple copies of the, the transgenic DNA, you know, damaged parts, par partial parts. And so you get this whole kind of a mess of an insertion event. And there are, uh, I totally agree with you, there are uh, mutations that arise from, from the chemical mutagens that, that people use in, in various forms of plant breeding. But, uh, the, um, it's, you know, we don't really have the data, I would say, to actually know how much damage is being created by each of these two methods. <clears throat> so there's very little research, actually. When we first published a paper in 2006 on the DNA that ends up in insertion events from biolistics, from particle bombardment, no one had ever, you know, there was all these claims of the precision of genetic engineering, but you know, nobody had ever sequenced the entirety of a particle bombardment insertion event, right, and compared it with the, the previously existing DNA. So that, so that, you know, companies were submitting applications, academics were, you know, sequencing parts of these insertion events, but they really did not know how much of the DNA flanking the insertion event and going on for how long and how much was lost. And none of that was basically known. And so, so uh, you know, and we still know relatively little, I would say. You know, the, I mean, the classic example is the papaya, the Hawaii papaya, right? That, that papaya has uh, either five or six different insertion events in it. The, the sequencing, the, the nature paper in which the genome is sequenced, it appears to be five, at least five, and it's, the paper kind of speculates about other 
at least one other piece of DNA that's in there. And these are spread all over the genome. And you know, what we, I would really like to see is the parent genome, a comparison with the parent genome. To see, you know, then we would actually have some real uh, solid data to be able to answer these kinds of questions with. But at the moment, you know, the, the, the good thing about mutation breeding and the good thing about GMOs is that you can back cross these plants. Right? You can basically, you know, companies do, right? They're aware of the issue. So they back cross their plants. But uh, if, for example, you breed a tree or if you breed a crop that's really hard to back cross, you know, people make claims for gene editing where they also will be doing biolistics and, and different ways of inserting uh, DNA. In order to do the gene editing process, they're making claims about how they'll do this in trees or do it in recalcitrant species like bananas and so on and so forth, but they will never be able to back cross that information, that the mutations that are created there. So, you know, I don't think I can, can actually answer your question fully, but I hope to give you some idea of the way I think about it. Uh, thanks a lot. I think, I think we're going to have to, uh, to, to call it for the day. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the Center of Hawaiian Studies uh, for hosting in such a, such a beautiful place. Uh, also, Hawaii Seed for hosting uh, Jonathan and bringing him as, as well to Kauai. Uh, the Shaka Movement for bringing him, him to, uh, to, to Maui. And uh, just to pull out a plug, uh, that if you are inclined to uh, support the uh, education in Hawaii, uh, to support groups like uh, Hawaii Seed, uh, uh, GMO Free Oahu, and, and other groups that are concerned about pesticides and GMOs on the islands. So thanks again, everybody. We have to uh, kind of clean up like by, by eight or so. So if you want to help a little bit to, uh, uh, with the chairs and so on, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank <laughs> you.